All right, chapter 21, orthopedic surgery. We'll review just a little bit. Let's see what we have um, as we continue. After studying this chapter, of course, you will be able to uh, recognize the relevant anatomy, like everything, all the anatomies are for every single system. You guys have to do know what those anatomies are. Summarize uh, disease of the muscle skeletal systems, um, things that normally prompt surgical, interve uh, su surgical intervention, the things that make us to say, well, we think this patient is uh, an ideal candidate to have surgery for such and such procedure. We should also determine um, orthopedic diagnostic procedure before the surgery, like how the patient get diagnosed. Of course, you already know x-ray has to be involved. We have to consider the patient history and physical. Uh, we have to understand what the patient is talking about. In addition, we also have to see what the patient is talking about before we can make those um, recommendations for surgery. And a special preoperative preparation that has to be considered, like x-ray, MRI, and all these defenses, so we have to know what those things are. Made it from the surgical point of view. Uh, from the technology's point of view, you have to anticipate some of those things that will be needed for the surgery during the intraoperative phase. Indicate the names and uses of orthopedic instruments. Uh, there are some orthopedic instruments that you may or may not be aware of. We'll talk about some of those things. Maybe the uh, distinctive one, not the drill, the drill bit, all the same that drill and drill bit. You can see those things in a lot of different specialties like uh, ENT or mass surgery. You can see those drills and drill bits in there. Uh, determine the intraoperative preparation. Uh, of the patient undergoing orthopedic surgery, what are things that will be done? Mainly, we have to consider those, um, uh, how you call it, those nerve plexus. You know, we want to make sure that we're not pinching out any, any nerve on the patient. We also want to make sure the blood vessels, um, mean that those are major arteries are actually padded. So all parts of the body can receive some blood, blood circulation or blood flow during the uh, surgical procedure. At the end, we'll summarize the surgical steps for orthopedic procedure. This will be one of two phases. So we started the first part by just considering the anatomy. Today, we'll probably just cover uh, the basic parts. We'll go and perform some of those surgeries, and we'll continue, hopefully, to finish up by tomorrow. So uh, it's going to be a fun morning. Interpret the purpose and expected outcomes of this orthopedic uh, procedure. Recognize the immediate post-operative care and possible complications of an orthopedic procedure. Now, I think your product is on uh, trigger finger release, um, um, plating and fixation. I think your product did those, may, um, those minor ones. The major ones where you would probably see in orthopedic surgery would be like uh, total knees and total hips. Those would be the, the, uh, the, the major one, like um, another one would be the uh, deep, the bone degeneration process. Um, like have I seen those things preparing the lamp for uh, implants, or robotics implants. I think those are like the bigger part of orthopedic surgery that you also see. Orthopedic surgery is a top notch when it comes down to oral surgeries and um, how you call it, uh, ENT. Yes, yeah, so this one becomes the top notch. This is as big as you can get. Uh, besides uh, neurosurgery and other things like that, which is just uh, an extension of orthopedic, but it's a different specialty. So bone surface, uh, when we're looking at these different characteristics, we talk about the living uh, tissue that you see when it comes down to the bones. Last time when we had our, <clears throat> when we had our discussion, we told you about the anatomy of the bone, and we told you the end of the bone was known as the what? Epiphysis. The epiphysis, that's correct. Whereas the diameter of the bone is the diaphysis. We'll also tell you that at the end of those bones, at the epiphysis level, you normally find a compact bone, not compact, but rather spongy bone. And that's where you normally find red blood cells or the formation of red blood cells. And then you have the bone marrow that you normally see, uh, you have the bone marrow within that area too as well. So we see red bone marrow and everything else. But we'll talk about it a little bit just as a review. Uh, and then we can continue out. Mm -hmm. Now we'll also talk about two bone formations. So bones are formed in two distinct ways. What are those two bone formation processes? Osteoclast. Okay, osteoclast is a little bit different. 
uh, for the two bone formation process we talk about was what in the chondria and what oh uh, intramembranous right yeah. now osteoclast osteoblast and osteocyte that's how the bones how it can be so uh, and then send back to the beginning and start over for those uh, bone particles that don't make it through the formation process. Now, characteristic of bone, they are all living tissue. We all know that. They have blood vessels and nerve in it as well because it goes in and out of the, uh, the pores of the bones. They provide a uh, form of structure for the human body, allow us to be able to move around, keep our body in shape with the assistance of the, mus uh, the muscular system. They are actively involved in the maintenance of hemostasis when it comes down to balancing their human body. And, and that hemostasis process not get involved with assistance uh, from the nervous system. We have skeletal system on the hand comprised of bones and pretty much as all it is, we tell you in an average person, there is a 206 bones that we have to consider. And most of the bones you normally find it in the what? Appendicular scarita, meaning the upper and lower extremity. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to talk about some of those things here in a minute. Joints, we talk about some of those joints. There are a lot of different joints that we talk about. Ball and socket, hinge joint, those different ones. I think we probably reviewed just a little bit the last time. Now, the scarita system itself, when it comes down to bones, they provide framework that support our body. It allows us to kind of like stay up erect and moving from one end to another with the attachment of those muscles. They actually help us say, hey, okay, we can move one end to the next, like take your foot forward. There's something that's causing our body to move the next foot to the to the forward motion to keep up moving or keep us standing or things like that. So it, it, it's kind of like real, it's, it's, it's pretty decent. It serves as a storage site for sources of calcium. And one, at one point, I think I probably told you guys that um, the human bone is um, pretty much uh, stronger than a reinforced concrete. Now, that is chemically. That's how we consider it because, it because of its chemical composition. That's what makes it to be stronger than a reinforced concrete. Uh, compact and cortical bone, we'll talk about it. Uh, you, you look at the hard part versus the dense part. If something is actually compact, well, that's what it is, it's definite heart. Uh, dense tissue of bones that surrounds the marrow of the, uh, the cavity. When I show you guys the picture of the uh, the, um, the hemorrhoids, uh, not the hemorrhoids, but the femur, I think you probably saw the distinction between uh, the epiphysis bone, the inner part when you actually take a look at the uh, inner portion versus the outer surrounding um, part, where as you see the, the compact area is on the outside and the spongy area relies on the inside part. Cancerous or uh, spongy bone. Spongy bone is also considered to be cancerous or uh, bone. When you start doing uh, surgery and you want to do bone graft, there are some bone graft material that will come up onto the surgical field. It can either be uh, be sold by a strike or other different type of, um, they call it different company. Now those bone will either be considered as uh, cancerous bone or they'll be considered compact bone. It just tells you that, hey, this bone, if it's cancer, that's made a spongy bone, it's a little bit softer that you can use in a specific location. If it's compact, you can use it to put place, uh, put it, uh, place and screws onto it and screw it right back into where you want it to be. Now, the cancerous particle, what we normally do is, um, it's almost like um, it's blend out or it's ground, ground bone. We can take those, mix it up, we'll, uh, some chemical formula we have, um, some chemical compounds we have in the operating, whether it will be blood or medication. We'll mix it up and pretty much put it into the side I want to put it in to help uh, the bone growth process of that specific site, especially when we start doing minor surgeries, like maybe uh, some type of ENT minor procedure or we're doing a LaFord one will bilateral split osteotomy and we need some bone grafting material we can use some of the patient bones we can also use bone from another uh, person or cadaver bone mix it up and have the bone process to actually grow successfully uh other things you see surrounding the bone is that we'll talk about it we we'll say uh if something else surrounding the bone or things that surround the bone we'll consider it to be the periosteum peri main around and osteum means bone bone marrow Semi-solid tissue that is formed within the space of a cancerous bone. The cancerous bone, again, is what is the, um, the spongy bone, and that is the middle part. The outside part of the bone is considered to be the compact bone, 
the middle part of the bone is considered to be the spongy bone or the cancerous bone. And I think we did a pretty good job on our last lesson. I actually show you a picture to see what are those things that we were talking about. And then you have a lot of different types of bones that we talk about. This is just a review again because we talked about this uh, previously. Long bones, one of those long bones that you see will be in the arms, the legs, and of course the hand. What is the longest bone in the human body? The femur. The femur. The femur is definitely the longest bone in the human body. Uh, and I think we probably talked about it last time. Short bones are normally bones you find within the wrist, the carpals and the ankles, the tarsal, those are uh, areas that you see. If they don't use wrist, they'll probably use carpals. Uh, if they don't use anchors, they'll use tarsal. So uh, those are some of the terms that you can get from middle wound. Flat bones, of course, you'll find those bones within the hip area, the scapula, the sternum, um, and of course the cranium. Uh, you can also see some of those flat bones within the ribs. Now, that flat bone that they're talking about, those bones are normally formed by what? What kind of bone formation? Is it in the chondria or intramembranous? Intramembranous? That would be in the chondria because you have the ribs in that the rib is cartilage, right? In the chondria, uh, chondria is pretty much um, cartilage. Endo means within the cartilage. So that, those bones would be considered um, things for uh, in the chondria bone formation. Uh, since more, pretty much we're talking about the round bones that you normally form within the tendon itself. Uh, very simple types of joint. These are some of the joints that we did talk about uh, during our last discussion. Uh, and most of these joints you will see, uh, we will be using most of these joints for construction purposes, you know, but it actually comes down to the human anatomy. All right, mineral storage. This story talks about uh, some of the different things that you see bones to be made of. Uh, it just shows that hey, these are the bones that we have, these are the things that are made of. And you see a lot of different terms when it comes down to the bone movement. I think we talked about some of these stories the last time where we talked about the calcium that focus on the metabolic process and normally help in um, removing the bones to maintain normal blood calcium levels. So sometimes the calcium level becomes too high. If it's too high, we have the endocrine system that comes in and regulate that calcium level. If it's too high, it uh, actually secretes a substance that decreases the calcium level or try to get the calcium level to be balanced. If the calcium level is too low, the endocrine system will also produce an enzyme that help increase that calcium level to its normal stage. It all depends on what we're talking about. We talk about osteoblast, osteoclast, and osteocyte. Uh, osteoblast, we say, was what? Something that actually helped the bone tissue. That's the formation process to start forming uh, the bone. Osteocyte was kind of like, you know, going back in, collecting those bones that were not successful in that formation process and getting them back to its normal area. Factors that normally affect bone growth, like we told you the last time, that uh, the growth plate a bone, the area in which we tend to start growing is located within the epiphysis, uh, within the epiphysis. Within that epiphysis, we have the growth plate. That growth plate is in there now. As we grow older, we tend, I mean, as we gain higher numbers in age, we tend to grow a little bit older and a little bit bigger. But everybody different. Everybody grows different. It could be a, um, something that will pass down from one generation to the next. Whereas, you know, if your parents or your father is taller, you continue to be taller. If your parents is kind of like shorter, you continue to be shorter, it kind of goes uh, in those wraps. But again, it could be a hummus level. If the hummus level is too high and continues to grow, well, they can find something to do by uh, doing something to the growth plate to start the growth process somehow. Uh, there's nothing I can say what will have to make you to grow faster. Heredity can be something passed down from uh, one parent or from one generation to the next. It could be a nutrition level, probably eating healthy a little bit, or it could be what your exercise that you're doing to increase not just your muscle mass, but also have a significant impact on uh, on your bone too as well, based on the type of medication you get you you taking in for your exercise. Some of the things that will normally cause um, some of these systems to have problems, especially the skeletal system, comes down to pathology when we start doing those different um, tests and other things like that, laboratory uh, finding will show something different. The system itself is prone to numerous types of um, infection or pathological condition. 
And of course, um, some of these conditions that you see can range from, you know, arthro, uh, what's that, arthritis, you have osteoarthritis, you have internal derangement of the knee joint, buccal handle tear, uh, joint mace. So a lot of different things can actually cause some of this. And it can be accredited to, um, to old age too as well. You know, old age can cause some of those problems. On page 897, you see most of the things in there. Uh, arthra, uh, arthrasia, that's like pain within the joint. That's start happening when you start getting a little bit older. Arthritis, of course, inflammation of the joint. Yeah, the older we get, we tend to experience most of these things that will be happening. So some of it happens to come about with age, and then some of it just kind of goes on with our body. Sometimes we put too much pressure on our body, especially for the Mediterranean. Um, all the things that we do, moving from one end to another, jumping from airplanes, uh, longer distances, uh, doing long mile hikes, you know, having over 50 pounds of supplies on our back, moving and going from one area to another, staying up all day, uh, getting shot at, being shot at, running, all those things. So uh, even the physical activity that we do for our annual physical assessment, whether it's the APFT or the PFA, <clears throat> those things, have some type of wear and tear onto the body. It's just that you buy something new over time, as you continue to use it, they tend to use their body, that's just how the human body is. So we tend to use our, our body too, the longer we try to keep our, our body with us. Uh, osteomalacia, uh, there are a lot of different ones, osteoporosis, primary osteoporosis, secondary osteoporosis, those are just Different different conditions and how some of these things can actually happen as you move forward. And then you see hairless vagus, hairless baggage, uh, coxal, uh, the error. So, a lot of different things that can occur in the human body as we get older. It could be the bone giving us on us, our tendon giving us on us, the tendon shirt giving us on us, or maybe we're having some of those like uh, osteo osteoporosis, uh, osteoritis, right? And that fluid are coming in, we have this brush set, I'll be continuing those fluid. I'll just be giving up. So some of the things that actually trigger a lot of different uh, conditions. Normal bone healing process actually continue within that part. We'll talk about some type of fractures that you may or may not even know. Um, and then we'll see how those fractures can be taken care of in, in a surgical uh, area. Uh, and then some of these fractures too that you'll see happens for a lot of different reasons. It could be due to traumatic reason or it could be stress on to the bone too much that it actually occurred. And what a fracture mainly is, it's just a discontinuation of a normal alignment of that bone. And again, like I was saying, it can be the cause of a lot of different things. Uh, some of those fractures that you'll see will be uh, a green stick fracture. Now, the green stick fracture is one of those fractures that will occur because there's a, a stress on the bone. It causes a minor energy and, you know, it is, it is not a complete break into the bone, um, but it's that we're putting too much pressure on that bone till the bone can no longer withstand it. So the bone is not ready to give up yet, but it's said I say, hey, I'm giving you a warning, you put in too much pressure on me, I can handle it, try to do something else. So that's how you see that green stick fracture might come into place. And it has spiral fracture to that will occur, normally it occur around the bone. So a lot of different fractures you see in there. If you look on page 902, you'll see those different fractures. Green stick fracture, you see that's the stress that be on the spiral fracture is actually separate. Um, Transcephalic fracture, you will not, I have not seen this one yet to occur in a patient. But the comedia and the transverse fracture, definitely you see that occurring. And that's one of the most common fractures that you see when performing orthopedic surgery. Compound fracture will more than likely be from some type of traumatic event that will occur, whether it's playing sport or motor vehicle accident or something. Uh, post fracture, that's a fracture that will occur when we have too much stress that's placed on, uh, on the tarsal bones within the foot. And that's the time you see those fractures. Okay, Corliss fracture definitely occur in the hand. And, you get some, and those are some of the fractures that you don't want to do by punching the wall. We try to avoid those things from occurring. But if a Corliss fracture does occur, you will realize that the distal radius uh, will have that one, the uh, epiphysis within um, 2.5 centimeter. And this one, 
will be caused by a direct force, such as folding, stretching, or even uh, your hand being using your hand to embrace yourself. It's about to, the weather is about to change here. So most of the commercial you normally see, you know, people will be sliding off the ice and then they'll be falling down. As you're going down, your instant kicks in. One of the most common things you do is you try to use your hand to brace yourself. Doing that can cause cordless fracture. So just be careful as you guys walking around when that, when that weather changes, be careful on how you're gonna uh, get some things to be done into that. The parts fracture, um, another thing we call the, um, the parts fracture is, um, I call it bimelia ankle fracture. It's just a fancy name that we gave it, but hey, we just look at a name, it's too long, we reduce it to something called post fracture. Uh, as you can see on our picture, this post fracture, what it normally do is the fibula, uh, is that the fracture of the fibula near the ankle often uh, accompanied by a break in the media, uh, media of the tibia. So this rupture of the internal, the internal lateral ligament. And if that lateral ligament is pretty much gone, we have a problem, you know. It could be a combination of doing, a, how you call it, abduction of the external rotator, a rotation from an evasion force, or it could be something totally different. But those are the simple fractures that you see. Fractures like these, uh, except for the transverse fracture that can be done uh, with external fixation, the rest of this fracture will have to be done with internal fixation. Now, green stick fracture and transverse fracture, we can kind of like employ some type of external fixation device onto it to help reduce that fracture and enforce or reinforce the heating process. The rest of them, definitely we will have to do uh, an open reduction internal fixation. Patient has to be open enough for us to fix it. Those are some of the fractures that you will definitely come across. Uh, normal process of bone healing, we already know that inf inf inflammation is the first stage of, bone, uh, of the healing process. So again, uh, inflammatory um, inflammation. You see inflammation may have cellular proliferation and then uh, calculus formation, ossifications, and remodeling. These things might be a little bit different based on the way how you see them uh, displaced up here, but everything contributes towards the um, the healing process when it comes down to any type of traumatic event that occur in a surgical patient. We we'll first consider the healing process above everything else. And in order for that healing process to occur, the first thing we have to do is make that patient bleed. If the patient bleed, well, we are all on the same track to understand that that bleeding would definitely help the healing process. All right. Other things that you also see in here, in, in the inflammatory stage. The inflammatory stage that you see written up here is that um, it begins at the time of the injury. Normally, that process will last for probably up to two days. Now, the fracture swelling or that fracture hematoma, uh, which will result as, uh, which will be the result of the extra, um, extra abscission of blood that will cause the injury is normally formed during this time. But what is interesting is that that blood will clot and serve as the, uh, the foundation for a sequential cellular proliferation stage. So the first stage of wound healing becomes that inflammatory phase. Once that inflammation occurs, we have that blood clot. That blood clot now will then you know, initiate the process we have now with the, um, the proliferation phase. Now, when we get to that proliferation stage now, this one, you know, normally it will, have, it will start occurring on, its own, on day two because we already told you that the inflammatory phase will be on what day? Day one and day two. So it will last for roughly about two days. So at the end of that two days, we, then, we can now see that uh, the proliferation phase will actually start. Now, it started because for some reason, if that fracture did occur, two ways it can happen. Either it was a stress fracture or it was some type of traumatic. So the proliferation phase now becomes, the, um, becomes effective immediately on the second day after the uh, traumatic event that occurred that caused that fracture to occur. And then that's the thing you start seeing um, 
macrophages will come in to do the debridement and of course the area will allow for the formation of the uh, of a fiber mesh that will seal that approximate uh, that will seal the approximate edges and this might not be accurate because we'll be losing some bones within that area unless the patient undergoes surgical intervention to realign that part uh, that bone to the its anatomical structure other than that it will do its best to try to align it but it's not going to be 100 percent aligned the fiber mesh will then serve as the uh, the foundation for those new capillaries and of course the fibroblast that we'll talk about between the fibroblasts will start the bone growth process uh, the soft tissue of the perioseum uh, castle would then be formed on the outer surface of the cortex of that fractured bone by some type of collagen producing fibroblasts and osteoblasts. So these fibroblasts and osteoblasts, what they're doing now is they're starting that bone formation process, this building new cells to help the healing process of the bone. So again, let's go back. A fracture does occur from a traumatic event, we have the inflammatory phase. That inflammatory phase lasts for roughly about two days. And what it's doing is it producing those extra blood to form a clot. Once that clot form, we get into the next stage, which is the proliferation phase. That proliferation phase now is where we then introduce the uh, fibroblasts or the osteoblasts to come in and start producing new cells to start the bone healing process, to start rebuilding that bone. So once I will come on our, um, Second day, it will take a while. It will go all the way from uh, from that second day to uh, maybe you know three to four days extra, and it will have the um, the cell formation stage. That calcul uh, that calculus formation phase. This one, this is the longest part that it will take. It will take anywhere from roughly about three to four weeks. What's happening is that since that fibroblast and osteoblast started that bone cell formation process, that soft tissue growth continues and the bone fragments now grow toward one another bridging that gap whatever gap that was in there now that soft tissue is helping to bridge that gap in whereas the osteoblasts and osteo, uh, osteoblasts have already started building new bone cells to start a healing process the osteoblasts that actually came in will form a matrix of collagen that will invade the periosteum cast or capsulum. What I will do now is, since the soft tissue breaching that gap, this osteoblast <clears throat> will come in, invade the periosteum calcium, and then it will start breaching the fracture site and uniting the two ends of that bone to come together. The fiber tissue collagen, and of course, the immature bone stabilizing the fracture site. But this process will take about three weeks. So everything has its own function. Bleeding comes, bleeding is the first process they form that blood clot. Blood clot is in there, right after two days, you have the proliferation phase that will kick in. Proliferation phase will take anywhere from, uh, you know, two to four days in between. And then all it's doing that is just building in new bone cells to start a healing process. The collagen formation now takes anywhere from three to four weeks. That process is a little bit longer. And all it's doing now is coming and say, well, since this fracture will occur here, I can see I have identified a gap in this. So let's go ahead and bridge that gap with either soft tissue and of course we'll, uh, we'll boom fragment. Let's build that gap in so at least we don't have a big old dent within that fracture site. And the next stage you have will be the uh, ossification phase. Ossification stage begins two or three weeks following the injury. It can last three to four months. So this process now takes a little bit longer. This is where all that healing process will go in. It was done in a, in a surgical setting. This is the time now that the patient will probably be going, um, will, will probably have a cast on because we want the patient to heal in an anatomical uh, fashion. So that cast will be on, the cast will help reduce some of those uh, swelling, but also help keep that bone in there for a while while the patient keep doing minor uh, uh, therapy, physical therapy for, for that limb that was fractured. The matrix of the osteoblast will now be called osteoid. And I, I think the last time we talked about this, I'll show you uh, some pictures, how those things in the mother form making their way down. So this is the same thing that's occurring here. As this is going on, you have that uh, uh, osteoblast called osteo comes in now. It will make the bone a little bit stronger by firmly uniting the bone. The bone is now able to accept mineral deposit. 
So that healing process is actually getting stronger and stronger. This is now, you know, the osteoblast forming in, changing into compact bone, now it's uh, I'm changing into uh, cancellous bone or spongy bone, now it's about to change into compact bone to be a little bit stronger. And then we have the remodeling. The remodeling stage is the maintenance stage of normal bone. Now, after the fracture did occur, and then the uh, devitalized tissue is uh, then remodeled, and the new bone is pretty much organized. Remodeling, you don't know what remodeling is, you know. Give it some waxy, give it some bling bling, make it look pretty. That's what the remodeling is. And it will continue throughout the life cycle, and of course, um, it's affected by local stress on individual's bones. So these are the uh, process in which bone formation normally occur, not bone formation, but these are the process in which that um, the healing process will occur if a fracture does occur on the bone. Uh, the first thing, if a fracture comes around, we notice a fracture. Uh, if we do nothing, it will go through the same process. If we happen to have a surgical intervention, it will still go through the same process. The only distinction between surgical intervention and letting it heal by itself is that surgical intervention will have, a, uh, have the healing process completed and the patient will still have their bones within its anatomical structure. Whereas normal healing process without surgical intervention may occur in um, uh, on even bone or the bone being healed with our, its anatomical landmark. That's the only distinction. But the whole thing will occur for both areas. Uh, distraction, you can also use distraction as well. Um, this is a patho pathological bone healing now. We'll start talking about distractions. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about distractions here. So when we, when we look at this uh, bone healing process, that distraction, that term, what it means is that um, we usually describe bone fragments that are normally separated so that the bone itself can contact, uh, the bone contact does not occur. So that distraction does not, I mean, all it is is it does not want a bone to get combined to another one, kind of try to keep it a little bit separated. Uh, so the bone contact does not occur. Uh, distraction can be caused by too too much weight, you know, that would normally apply uh, onto the traction. I will tell you what attraction is in a minute too as well. Uh, I think that's one of the terms that most people get call it confused for distraction. So distraction sometimes can be linked with uh, complication, known as um, interposition of soft bones. Now. What that means is that the gap will not only be formed, the gap formed by the distraction will allow the soft tissue to grow over the end of one of, the, uh, one of both fractures ligament. That soft tissue will then seal off that surface of that fracture bone, disallowing the, uh, the inflammation of the hematoma to form and kind of like uh, excluding calculus formation. Now, when that result, that bone unit become poor, so that healing process is actually out of the way. Imagine trying to get this bone to heal together, but for some reason, you have something else interrupting that healing process. You got a bunch of, if you have two bones together, and you have this bone in line for that bone to heal and become one. And then you got some type of adipose tissue or some type of uh, soft tissue going in the middle of that, uh, of that bone at the fracture site. It makes it difficult for that bone to heal. And that's why we try to avoid distraction when we're doing um, orthopedic surgery. We either get some CM in there to take x-ray as we put in the screws and drip it in. But before we get to that point, we will make sure through the dissection, we remove every single soft tissue at that side. We will dissect it out. And the dissect it out, it makes everything is good before we start putting the place and screws in. And then you have um, a vascular neurosis. So, a vascular neurosis is uh, it's kind of like interesting. This one will occur when the uh, the capillary because we're talking about vascular, uh, we're talking about blood flows now. We occur when the capillary network or uh, um, or the uh, collateral circulation cannot be reestablished. So if that kept, if for some reason that fracture occurred, that capillary was broken, if we cannot reestablish another one, this will happen. No blood going up and down. There was a picture I showed you guys from our last discussion where as when that fracture did occur, you saw the hematoma was in there, um, something happened, you saw phycocytosis and pentocytosis came around where phycocytosis went and pretty much reabsorbed those pieces of broken bones that was within the cell, uh, within that fracture site. 
and then pentacytosis came around and tried to reabsorb those blood uh, within that area that was forming that inflammation, try to take that out. But in another picture, you also realize that since that blood vessel was actually broken, was damaged, what happened? A new blood cell formation, I mean, a new blood supply route start to recreate. And that's what this is. So uh, a vascular neurosis, what we're trying to avoid is if there is a surgical interruption of or uh, a traumatic interruption of that blood supply, we don't want that to be the only site that blood can travel from one end of that patient arm to the next. You want to make sure there is another route that that blood can actually travel to. And then you have compound fracture. We'll talk about compound fracture just a little bit. It just compromises the integrity of the skin, allow for the possible uh, entry of microorganisms to get within the patient body and start causing infections of the bone, injury, and start surrounding and start the surrounding soft tissue. That's what compound fracture is. You will see on that picture in your textbook, we tell you exactly, give you a picture of what a compound fracture is. It's like that bone has been, you know, a fracture in multiple pieces, you know. Now, if that occurs and it's coming out and it's penetrating outside, it makes it easy for the infection. If there's any infection around it, it will enter out of the soft tissue. And when it enters the soft tissue, uh, tissue because that bone has already been fractured, the bone marrow is exposed. It makes it easy for that uh, infection to enter the, uh, um, the bone itself. And then you have delayed union, non-union, and uh, mild union. So for this one, all it is is that individuals normally have different, um, different rates. So for this delayed, delayed union, it's just a term that we use to uh, describe an increase in the heating time of the fracture. You know, if let's say inflammation is supposed to occur for one to two days and it never occurred during that time, yeah, that's a term that we use to say delayed you know. Um so the um the distraction of the fracture site can also be considered as a delayed union. A non-union on the other hand is uh, when the fracture bone ends do not reunite and do not unite. So um, pretty much if you don't come together, it's not doing it. My unit on the other hand occurs when the fracture heals in a position that does not resemble the original anatomical form. So this is the one that will occur when you know the patient has some type of traumatic event but never had any type of surgical intervention done and allow the bone to heal by itself. That healing process will be done, but it becomes a my unit. Now, I'm not just saying that my unit you know, will occur in a, a non-surgical intervention healing process. It also occur in a surgical intervention healing process, especially if the, uh, the surgeon fails to correctly uh, align the bone to its anatomical structure or never follow the right casting method to cast a bone just for the place and screws in. Yes, this can occur. If, and if we realize this occurring in a patient and we have to go back, and re-perform the surgery. Hopefully, those bones and soft tissue within that side, they are still in tight to be reopened. And then you have compartmental syndrome. So this is an increase in the pressure with a, a closed space that usually um, will occur in the forearm, the tibia. You know, when we have these fracture ends of the bone uh, cause excess, uh, excess pressure that leads to some type of uh, neurovascular compromise that becomes a compartmental uh, syndrome we're looking at. Now, other thing can cause this, that would be, um, you know, from the cast material that we're using, the cast could be too tight, or it could be something that, you know, within that area it was bleeding and we just ignore the bleeding and we still put a cast on anyway. No. So that's what would be, that's what happening. The casting material has to be precise. That's why the surgeon has to determine what kind of casting material they're using based on the type of um, fracture or surgery that they realize. And of course, the heating process. How is the patient heating? Can we still feel the distal end of that fracture on the patient? Uh, like if a fracture occurs in the arm, can we feel the finger to realize if blood is going back and forth? If blood is not going back and forth, we'll probably want to reduce that um, uh, that cast that was on it so we can test and make sure there's a blood flow. So compartmental syndrome will kind of like occur from um, the casting material that we actually use.
those are some of the things that you see. And then you have uh, for casting material too, the sergeant can decide what type of material that they will be using. You know, they could use a lot of different ones based on the advantages and disadvantages. So you have a fiber glass casting materials that can be used. So the fiber glass or plaster, what will happen is that, I mean, this is the one that is most commonly used type of casting material. And it has a lot of advantages and a lot of disadvantages. Uh, some of the advantages that you see from fiberglass or plaster, I don't know if you have seen this, but what will happen is if you are water read, you go down to the orthopedic section, we have a cast, a casting material in there. We have a specific card that we use for all the casting material. You just grab it and take it right in, and then we can use that to do our casting material. If you have a chance to do it, have fun with it. Uh, just make sure you follow the proper PPE to have it on when you're preparing those cast material because uh, they have uh, some of them have a toxic odor and you don't want to breathe that in. But if you look at the fiber glass and the plastic, uh, some of the advantages that you see, they are very strong. Uh, they are stronger than, I mean, especially fiber glass. Fiber glass is stronger than plastic, but again, it's okay. Um, they are normally achieve uh, weight bearing. So if you if that patient is overweight, other things like that, we can we can handle it with, with these two things. Um, they stretch a little bit, uh, but fiberglass on the other hand will stretch faster than plastic, which is you know very very good. It is waterproof, it is, it is durable, and it is lightweight. So we're not putting that much weight on the patient. Even if the patient happens to be overweight, that's fine. The fiberglass will stay handled. But some of the disadvantages of these two is that, uh, yes, even though they have some good advantages, it's also expensive. And then uh, one of the things that will happen is that um, it is waterproof, but if for some reason it must be dry, like if water gets on it, you probably don't want to get it dry real quick. Because um, if you don't do it that way and that water tends to penetrate it, it just looks like it's mixing up the material you know, but it could make uh, that a uh, fracture site tighter and it could pretty much cause a compartmental syndrome because the original way how the data was probably precise. Now you got water going into it, getting wet. It's supposed to be water resistant, but if you get wet, we'll have to dry it up because we don't want the water to get on the inside part. If it does, then we'll have to be worried about compartmental syndrome on that patient. So I just wanted things for you to think of. Um, there's a split that can be used to as well if a split is being used. Um, it's being applied. One of the things we normally do is put a flash sheet of the uh, the casting material uh, to be used on there. But normally, let the surgeon know what you may or may not be doing. Now, plaster, on the other hand, it is inexpensive, even though um, what is your fiberglass is expensive. Plaster is not. It's very cheap. Uh, it is not waterproof, which is a bad thing. Uh, it is easy to manipulate. Um, it is rigid. But one of the things that you also see on that is that uh, breaking down of the casting material can lead to reapplication. So if you want to take a look and see what's going on for some for whatever reason, let's say uh, the patient complaint that is too tight, you want to reduce it a little bit, or want to put more space in there, you have to take everything out and then redo it again, redo a new one. So that's one of the ignoring part about it. But most surgeons would take um, it all depends. Would would take fiberglass over plaster. If they have to choose, both of those things will be ideal to use as a casting material. They can take that and make good use of it. And we'll move on. You have your extra material that will be in there. Well, you already know we use x-ray to pretty much uh, take a look and diagnose the patient. In other cases, we'll take a look to see if the place and screws we put in there stay tight. We can do an intraoperative flow. We can do a post-operative flow. We can also uh, use that in dry, I mean, uh, pre offered so It all depends what we are trying to get. And this is the time now for orthopedic surgery when you're using those x ray in there. You always have to have on your protective equipment. You need to either have a lead apron on that will cover your body, especially your thyroid and your reproductive organ, or you can be six feet away from it, or you can stand behind someone who already has a lead apron uh, applied onto their body to avoid some of these things. Um, but it's pretty, it's pretty interesting too when it comes down to these x-rays. So if you're doing orthopedic surgery, be prepared for the worst. Always have a lead apron on you before you pull your surgical gown on. 
So in the procedure that you see when talking about instrumentation, we require a general orthopedic step with a soft tissue and a basic uh, bone instrumentation. Yes, you probably have a lot of different instruments set in there. Orthopedic surgery, one of the things that we do is, especially if we're using uh, plating and position sets, like maybe Stracker, Sintis, uh, Biomare, whatever other thing, uh, company there is out, out there, they will have their representative to be in the operating room with you. And those individuals know exactly what materials that they have. They will probably talk to uh, their doctors the day before the surgery so they can understand what type of plate, size, uh, whatever they will be using so we can make sure we have those things ready. And that makes it easier for you. So when you get ready, you have all those things in there, it makes the surgery go by very fast and easy. But also requires specific sets with instrumentation. That's where the uh, uh, the seals rep comes in. When you start doing the exposure, reduction, and internal fixation of the bone for you know replacement of the joint, other things like that, the rep will be in the, uh, for that process. Procedure procedure for the hand and, and the foot. They are no, normally typically require a minor orthopedic or hand set. And this these are the cases that will be done like very quick. You don't need that many instruments for these minor procedure. But your total hip and your total joint definitely you need a, a little bit of equipment in the operating room. A lot of different instrumentation. On page nine to nine, you see some of those instruments in there, like uh, the hips. The hips will be a uh, bone reduce a uh, fracture reducing forcep. You have um, <clears throat> you have the multiple suture passer. Yes, it allows us to pass suture uh, within that joint, within that fracture area real quick, easy. That's why that needle allows you to actually grab a handle and pass it through. And then you have the, uh, the knife handle, well, that should be easy, the wire or suture pass, uh, scissor. So there is a wire scissor that we normally use for wires that, uh, in orthopedic surgery. You don't use a regular scissors. You use those wire scissors to get, to get the job done. If you have to use something else, then we'll have a problem. Low man bone holding faucet, that should not be strange to you. Uh, most of those instruments you on 910 uh, instrumentation that you should be familiar with, especially when it comes down to the routine um, equipment. Routine equipment will be things like um, the uh, bovin machine, the suction, all those different things that you normally see in every surgical procedure. That should be very easy and simple. Uh, those things will not change from one room to another unless you pretty much don't need them. Uh, the ruler, yes, lips and bronze, those are simple instrumentations that you might come up with. Uh, positioning devices, we want to make sure we have sufficient positioning devices in, our, in the operating room, mainly for the patient comfort. We don't want the patient coming in for some type of surgical procedure and they have to leave from that operating room with another problem or with another condition. We have a pneumatic tourniquet that we will use and that pneumatic tourniquet will be used for a specific reason. Uh, uh, one of the uh, primary functions of that pneumatic tourniquet we use um, to provide bloodless surgical sight. So it allows, it, it allows us to be able to see or to help our seeing process. So at least when making our incision on the patient, uh, we don't have to use that much of a ray text or last sponges. Uh, it will help restrain the amount of blood flow that will be coming to the surgical site. Now, the surgeon will actually uh, is going to be extremely by elevating, by elevating and wrapping the distal to press man. That's how we do it. So when, I, when we start wrapping that extremity, we're going from distal to proximal because we want to make sure that if we're using the ACE wrap or the S band bandaid, we just want to make sure that uh, we don't have that much of a bleeding on the opposite side that will come back into the surgical field. So if we're doing, uh, let's say, if we're trying to work on the um, on the radius bone, right? We have to after prep, we have to take that arm, raise it up, raising it up will allow that blood to be sort of drained down towards the heart. And then we can start using the ACE band, they are the ACE or the SMA, uh, the ACE band or the SMA wrap. We can use that and start wrapping from the distal end of that ramus bone going toward the proximal. And what that's doing is it just helping to drain that blood with some type of um, mechanical pressure to drain that blood towards the heart. So when we start, when we apply that pneumatic tourniquet, where it's stopping the blood from coming back to uh, the phalanges. Uh, it can help to reduce that surgical fee instead of just laying it down and do everything else. Now, so that's one of the main reasons, uh, one of the good things with the pneumatic tonic, it, it helps provide 
a bloodless surgical site. It's, it's a bloodless, so some means there will not be blood, there will be a little bit of blood, okay? Uh, we'll try our best to keep some blood in there. But there's some other things that has to be done with this one. So the tourniquet itself will be inflated. A popular tourniquet is pretty much a double cough pneumatic tourniquet. So if you look at the blood pressure cough, it's double cough. So that's how the pneumatic tourniquet will be looking like. If one cough actually fails to inflate, the second cough is supposed to be able to provide a needed pressure. Now, in addition to the cough itself being all that fancy and to inflate, uh, to reduce, uh, it ultimately help to reduce the uh, constant pressure on one side of the extremity to avoid pressure-induced injury. And that's one of the things we try to avoid. But after we apply that tourniquet on the upper extremity, right, there are some things we have to take into account. Now, injury to the nerve and blood vessel continuous, uh, continuous tourniquet pressure should not be applied for more than one hour on the upper extremity. So if we're putting the blood pressure cuff on the upper extremity, there are some other rules that we do have to follow. We can, use, we can leave that on there for more than one hour. Okay, if one hour passed, surgeon have to be notified so we can reduce it and then have to be notified again afterwards. Now, on the, it's different when it comes down to the lower extremity with that pneumatic tourniquet. Well, the pneumatic tourniquet going on the lower extremity, it has to be on there no more than one and a half hours. Upper extremity, no more than one hour. Lower extremity, no more than one and a half hours. Now, after one hour of pressure, that's, I mean, what we normally do is we notify uh, this surgical team that, hey, that bent on for over one hour on the upper extremity, what do you want to do? Okay, they will tell you, so, okay, we do open it up a little bit, let some blood go in, because you don't want to keep it on there too tight so that the cells on the opposite side, the adjacent side of that land, starts to die out. That's what we have to reduce and let them know. Now, after that initial one hour on the upper extremity, once we release it and allow the blood to go through, we're going to tie it back up. The moment we tie it back up again or increase the pressure on it, we have to notify the surgical staff. Or the surgical staff have to be notified every 15 minutes after that. So we can make sure that you know there is not too much of a blood loss or too much of a tissue trauma based or tissue death based mm -hmm. on uh, the absence of blood. And that applies for both. Mm -hmm. So upper extremity, tourniquet, the minor tourniquet should be on there for no more than one hour. And after that, surgeon, uh, surgical staff should be notified every 15 minutes. Lower extremity, the minor tourniquet can be on there for no more than an hour and a half. But again, surgical staff have to be notified every 15 minutes after that. Even though they are notified at the end of that one hour, the end of the one and a half hours, they still have to be notified constantly every 15 minutes. Hey, this is what's going on. This is what's going on. And if for some reason we decide, to say, hey, leave it on there. Don't worry about it. It has to be documented that the surgeon decided to leave that pneumatic tourniquet on there and stay ignore that 15 minutes into the war. So if something goes wrong, they can be responsible for it and they should be able to explain after that. Now, sometimes the procedure can be a little bit long and um, the surgeon might request to be temporarily deflated and of course then re -implanted. So it happens and that's the break period that we, we're talking about. And then the other thing you have is traction. Traction, last class I had, they, were, they kind of confused traction a little bit uh, with something else. But uh, traction, what it does is um, it allows us to, uh, uh, it's an alignment that can be used preoperatively. You know, we can use it on three different aspects. We can either do it during pre-op, we can do it during the surgery, it's so we should be intraoperatively, or we can do it after surgery. Now, it's supposed to help us immobilize a joint to reduce a fracture, or put, uh, to help us align body parts. That's what a traction will be doing. So we can do it in all three phases of the surgical process. Now, there are three types of different uh, traction that can be done manually. Um, and one of those, those three types of fracture, it, it could be done with uh, manual intervention, it could be done with the skin, or it could be done with the bone itself. Uh, the bone part or the bone traction that we'll be using can, um, can be frequently applied in the operating room setting. Whereas uh, we take that, um, that during the sterile procedure, we'll then take a sterile instrument, we use it to, um, uh, to insert uh, a, a skeletal uh, traction, include 
uh, like the knife handle with a number 15 blade. You know, we can do that, or we can probably take um, a power drill, the, uh, the stem of pins. You can take your stem of pins, and I'll tell you more about the stem of pins later on, so you can see, especially when we start doing the different sort of what the stem of pins would normally do. Uh, there is a traction board that we can use, or even a pin cutter. You can take those and uh, use that to place the frame, the traction frame, and place it on the patient post-operative bed. And what that's supposed to do is supposed to help with those different weights to be used on that traction. So this traction, you ever want to immobilize the joint to reduce that fracture by the end of the surgery now, what we're transporting that patient, we want the patient to, want to be, we don't want the patient to put too much pressure on that, uh, on that lamp. So we'll put something on there to help the air to be able to help balance a whole of that lamp for them as they move from one hand to another. But I'll tell you more about that stem of pains there because the stem of pains have, happens to have a significant impact on surgery too. And then you have our wonderful laser. I think we'll talk about laser at some point in time, um, back in a couple of chapters ago, when we started talking about those um, YAG laser, CO2 laser, and everything else. I think we'll talk about laser a little bit. So this is a slide review process for you. It is, uh, we can use laser in a lot of different surgical procedures, especially orthopedic surgery. And laser that will be most commonly used in orthopedic surgery is the CO2 laser. Because again, CO2 laser, we told you guys that it don't work well in fluids, right? So uh, general surgery and orthopedic surgery definitely be using CO2 laser. It's very slow, um, slowly in kind of like creasing up. But what what interesting about this CO2 laser is that um, sometimes if we're using those instruments, the laser may become even more attractive in the future and, uh, because it's kind of like precise when they cut it, it just cut that quick and you get things done. So the CO2 laser will be the primary laser that we we'll use in orthopedic surgery. Now we might kind of use the ND YAG laser too as well. Uh, when we start doing some type of knee arthroscopic, um, but mainly will be CO2 laser. Uh, there's a thing called bone cement, polymethylene maricale, uh, methylene maricale. So polymethylene maricale or PMMA, that is a bone cement in a powder form, right? I will tell you more about it when we start doing total hips and total joint. Uh, Methylene myocardial, which is MMA, is a bone cement in a liquid form. So if we're using that bone cement in a liquid form and get attached to uh, the bone or something, we want to get it out, we don't want to cut that bone out. So what we do is we get a CO2 laser, and the CO2 laser is the idea removal tools for that uh, liquid bone cement. That's how that will work. So if we want to move a liquid bone cement from a bone, instead of us cutting that bone with drills, reamers, and saw, we just use a CO2 laser and makes it easy to have that to be removed. That's the easy way to take it out. And then you have air flows that will continue on in the operating room. Uh, normally this will, be, this will be done to prevent infection uh, I'll be critical during the orthopedic uh, procedure, so we'll have that airflow, that airflow going up straight. Now, the airflow will be going in one direction. We'll have a laminar airflow system in the operating room, provide highly fitted air. It goes in one direction, one direction only. Yeah, when I talk about, when I think about one direction, I think about the band, but yeah, it's not that one direction. But yeah, the airflow will travel in one direction, and I think we'll talk about a filtration system at some point, hip hop being a filtration system, uh, what, three to four exchange repair. Per minute or what? Um, but we'll talk about some of those numbers again so you can understand how that air exchange rate normally comes into place, whereas we have that 80% of filter air and how that air comes in, where is the positive air, where is the negative air pressure actually located, what do we consider, what, what do we consider the operating room doors to be closed, why are we doing that, why do we restrict most of those passages, um, why do we restrict traffic in the operating room? Why we say when it's, uh, when a patient comes in the room in one door or through the double door, we try not to use that double door during the surgery, but rather use the opposite door to go in and out. All of those things have specific reason to reducing some type of microbial count or some type of infection in the operating room. When we get into microbiology after uh, chapter 24, I will explain that to you more in depth so you can understand what uh, we meant by reducing microbial count. And then you have continuous passage range of motion machine. So this other one talks, uh, it's a little bit 
different other people might consider it to be like robotic surgery and other things like that, but it's a little bit different. We look at the knee, the elbow, the shoulder, and the, uh, uh, those are things we talk about uh, range of motion. We don't want to overextend those extremities because if we do that, we decrease the process, uh, we decrease the effect of the mobilization. Uh, so we kind of keep it very close so we don't cause too much trauma to the patient while they're going through uh, their surgical intervention. And then trans, um, transcussions, electric nerve stimulation. This is something that will be done in the operating room too as well. And all we're doing is we want to check that nerve and see how functional that nerve is, if that nerve is safe uh, working after we make our surgical intervention. So it is a portable battery operator unit uh, with electrodes that are normally placed on the skin near the source of the uh, of the pump. So all we're doing is we're checking that nerve area to say, hey, is this a nerve? If it's not a nerve, then we'll continue to cut it. Because sometimes the nerve will trick you, it looks like tissue, and we don't want to cut the nerve because if you cut that nerve, it becomes a problem. So we can use this to identify nerve, preserve it, and then continue on. I think you have probably seen this. In short, we just refer to it as a nerve stim we just refer to it as a nerve stimulator. A nerve stimulator. And that's all it's doing. We'll use it, plug it onto the skin, and then use the tip of it to identify where that nerve is. If you hit that nerve, uh, we should see some type of movement in the uh, adjacent uh, um, extremity of that patient. And once we identify it, now that tells us that, hey, don't cut that nerve, because if you cut that nerve, patient can do this. If for some reason that nerve has been cut, another thing that we can do is use that same nerve stimulator to identify that nerve and then reconnect it real quick. Uh, before the patient is discharged from the operating room. And then you have your saws, your drills, and your reamers. These are things that will be used to start uh, making our incision into those different bones. Uh, they are all power instruments that can either use air or nitrogen, or sometimes they can use electrical outlet or electrical current uh, to power it up to start cutting. Uh, surgical, well, the ST, sometimes, in most cases, the surgical technology has to be familiar with assembling these, uh, these type of instrument. So there are two directional uh, terms that must be understood in relation to um, the use of power, uh, power saw. So we have one to be considered the oscillating saw. Oscillating saw, what that means is that um, the blade of that saw is actually moving from one side to the next. So it moves from side to side, or it oscillates. And oscillate means that it's the same thing as side to side. So in a, recipro in a reciprocating saw, the saw blade is will kind of move back and forth. So you have to understand these two things when it comes down to uh, oscillating versus reciprocating. If you're reciprocating stuff, what are you doing? You're kind of repeating what just happened right you reversing the action of it going back and forth back and forth all day if you're oscillating you're kind of moving from one side of it of one item going on to the other side so you have to understand how these things impact um the surgical uh surgical feeling orthopedic surgery so you have the oscillating sword oscillating sword means that it goes in one direction regardless what it is what kind of as long as it's a sword it goes in one direction and I mean, it goes in two directions, rather. Right? Those two directional has to be understood in one or two ways. It can either be an oscillating soil that moving side to side, or it can be a reciprocating soil that will be moving from back to forth. And that's something that we have to understand, or it's reciprocates. And we can use those soil on bones, cutting, and other things like that. Um, two type of motion, other things. Now you have our uh, arthroscopic equipment. We'll talk about arthroscopic equipment here in a minute so you can understand how those things work. Now, drills is easy. Drills and remote drills are very easy. The one that gets a little bit complicated, uh, confusing is the saw, which one moves side to side versus which one moves back, back and forth. Uh, drill just go in and out, but we control it. Remus is the same thing, so you have to understand what those, um, those things are. And then you have arthroscopic equipment. This one is pretty much from the side doing shoulder scope and knee scope and other things like that. Yes, you know, it's a, we're doing some type of uh, scope, right? So we need some camera. We probably need some light source in there. Uh, our arthroscopic pump for TV of the fluid. We need some power shaving system because hopefully it will go in for a meniscus steer. You know, we probably want to do it arthroscopically. We can go in and actually shave, uh, shave the meniscus and take what we need to take out. 
we need some video recording system and photograph just in case we want to take pictures for out of petition purpose or to give to the patient and say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what we saw. What do you think? Should we continue this? Or this is what we saw and this is how we fix it. And it can also be used to help teach a uh, junior resident. So they can be able to identify uh, the condition the patient had before and the surgical intervention are actually clean up all those tears that they had and how they look in the, the pre-op picture and the post-operative picture so you can see those two and then make comparison which one actually works fine. Routine supplies will be in there too as well. Orthopedic requires large number of supplies, casting material, you know, we always talk about casting material. So the cast material will be there, will be sitting uh, normally outside. We can always bring it in from the auto core itself. And we can use the casting material in the end. Um, and then you have other things that you see in there too as well in conjunction with those routine materials. You have the implant, the suture. Uh, but methylene mercury, so that is the bone cement that's in the powder form. I'm gonna talk about it here a little bit so you can understand what's going on. But one of the good things about these implants is that um, we never ready flash an implant. Implant has to be, it has to go through the full sterilization process. And we talk about that sterilization process already. Uh, I align the uh, instrument to stay in there for X amount of time between 270 to 75 degrees and all this, we've already talked about it, but we will review again what we've done. And for some reason, if something is not working fine, we can always uh, report that directly to the Food and Drugs Administration because they will require proper documentation to tracking that implant. So if an implant goes into a patient, implants supposed to have a, a description, whether it was a Y plate, a Z plate, uh, the type of screws that went in, it has a number on it, all the things has to be tracked. So if a patient starts having problem, we can notify the Food and Drugs Administration, our administration and then they can figure out what to do afterward. But the patient will come in, we'll take care of the patient, either take it out, put new one in, and then we'll go from there. But the manufacturer too will also be contacted, the manufacturer of that product. So we have to keep track of the number of implants that we put in, the types of implant, the size of the implant, and of course, the manufacturer's serial number. Those are the, uh, those are the in, uh, information that we use, not only to pay the, um, the uh, sales representative bill or the uh, manufacturer bill, but also to keep it for our record. So if something happens to that patient tomorrow, we can go back and put out that information and say, hey, we use so and so product. This is what happened. Infection rate for this one is too high. I think you'll have to rework on your strategy on new product. I don't think your product suits our patient clientele responsibility because now we're having to see more infection rate on your product as compared to other product. They can do that. And it's up to the OR director to actually continue to work with our company or to change the strategy and work with a different company. And then you have the uh, polymethylene mercury. Uh, we'll talk about suture. Before I skip suture, I'll talk about suture here real quick. So when you look at these different sutures, you realize that uh, it's a lot of different ones. Suture that we normally use in the operating room will be uh, fiber wire. Uh, all that is, is like, it's, a put, uh, it's something that we use on the, uh, the tendon and meniscus tear repair when we start doing it. It's very strong. That's what we use it when doing a meniscus tear, tie it onto. It has surgical steel, yeah. Surgical steel can be definitely when connecting bone to bone, we can use that on it too as well, or we can use it to close up the sternum, uh, especially in cardiothoracic procedure. Uh, you have um, ectobone. Ectobone can be used to when we start preparing tendon or attaching tendon to bone, or we can even use proline uh, to do tendon, tendon to bone too as well. Uh, one of the things that you'll see in there is chromic and vacuum. So those are the type of different sutures that you see us using in orthopedic surgery. Now, the size of these sutures might be different. It will range anywhere from 3-0 up to, I mean, what, 2 or 3 or 4 It all depends what side I'm trying to work on. But I'll be some of the sutures that you'll see in there. And in most cases, we'll probably be using some non or sutures, only because um, if we're repairing ligament, tendon, or muscles, we, we don't want uh, a double suture to be used because if it happens, those things or those parts might go back again to its traumatic event or traumatic stage. So if we use a non observable one, it's actually stay in place and hold it tight uh, for as long as it can. Now, for the metronomic or PMMA, 
This, in short, we refer to it as a bone cement. It is the only place that we use this is mainly when we're doing total joint or total plastic. It helps us to it help us in stabilizing and also keeps the implant in correct anatomical position. The cement will normally fill the cavity uh, in the space of the uh, the bone to form a uh, a bond between the implant and the bone because the implant you see it's an it's, it is an iron okay so. There's no other way we can, you know, suture an iron to the bone, or there's no other way that we can put a drill bait or, or yeah, a drill or a screw into an iron to go into the bone. There's no other way to do it. So the best thing uh, we can do is get a bone cement that we can put on it to hold it in place. But one of the things that have to be done is that uh, when we're mixing this bone cement, we have to mix it up as being sterile because it's going into our open wound. So we have to maintain sterility. Away. Another thing is that when using this bone cement, when we're mixing it up, we have to attach, we have to attach some type of suction onto it to exhaust the film because if you, you don't want to absorb that film in by breathing it in. And if you do have on contact lenses, you probably don't want to be the one mixing this bone cement together because what it does is it will mess your contact lens onto your eye and it becomes difficult for you to remove it. So those are just some things that you have to take into consideration when you're working on it or when you're mixing it up. Routine supplies are uh, very simple. Uh, your glove, basin, set, marking pen, uh, dressing material, you can have those things on. One of the things that you don't want to do is for the dressing material, especially when it comes down to the four by four, you don't want to have a four by four on your surgical field open up with the same as your red test because it's sometimes get people confused. So you want to keep your, you want to hide it on your back table for as long as you can and want to pull it out when you're ready to do the closure. But you get, you see some night blades all up on there. You see a three quarter sheet, just some typical things that you see when it comes down to orthopedic surgery, just routine stuff, routine supplies. And we're going to get into a surgical, uh, surgical part of it. But before we get into that surgical part, we'll pause here for a minute and let's see if you happen to have any questions. So, what question do you have? None right now. Nothing right now. Wow. Man. Uh, you said polymethyl um, was the powdered, just powdered form? Okay. Yeah, put it, put it metal in my powder. So now Oh, hold on. Is it, uh -huh. is it so, yeah, that would be considered the PMMA. Now, the other one, the MMA, is just a liquid form. So, the PMMA is a powder form, the MMA is the liquid form. Okay. And then the traction that allows alignment that can be used in pre, intra, and post? Yes. Okay. So if a patient in a week, you have more pain from one end to another, we can have that patient legs in attraction as we open them out. Uh, if they're in a gurney, you know, we don't need to hold that legs in a gurney. In a week, yeah, we can. Okay, that's all the questions I have. All right. All right, brothers. Let's see uh, let's see what we have. All right, so uh, this is what we're going to do. Uh, orthopedic is very long and it is interesting. So, what we will do is that uh, we will stop here and then we will finish this up tomorrow. Uh, it's a lot in orthopedic, and I don't. That's why I take my own time to go over it because the last CSC exam, they had a lot of um, orthopedic questions on it. So we will stop here today and then tomorrow we'll finish uh, this section of this section of orthopedic. We, we have a lot to do, but at least we'll cover the introductory part, we know the anatomy, then we'll get into the surgical part, whereas we start talking about how the surgery is normally done, we'll start talking about shoulder scope,
backup um, procedure, whether it's open or microscopic, uh, acrimioplastic. Uh, again, it could be open or autoplastic, and then we start doing some total shoulder and total knee, total hips. When we get into the surgeries, because there are a lot of terms in there that you have to know. And those terms, I don't want it to get you confused because it's too much. So we're taking our own time to cover these little by little, step by step. So at least when that time comes, when you see some of these things, you can recognize and say, okay, well, that's what this is. This is what this is. So uh, we will start that for today and then we'll finish up tomorrow. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask. If not, uh, we'll see you tomorrow at 1100. Yes, HM2. Yes, HM2. All right, y'all have a good one, fellas. Have a good day, HM2. All right.